for you to be hands-on and uh, do something in a very real way to help these precious uh, children in Mexico there. So if you want to be a part of that, this gives you the great opportunity to do so. All right. Again, it's a real blessing and joy to see each one of you here. Please continue to pray. As I mentioned last night, the Hogues have a new great-grandson. His name is Finn. Uh, he was born with a detached esophagus, and his kidneys are fused together. And uh, they did surgery, tried to reattach or attach his esophagus, and uh, they were not successful. They couldn't do it. Um, so he'll probably be at CHOP for at least two months, and uh, there'll be other procedures and things going on. So if you could just remember to pray especially uh, for little baby Finn, then we would uh, really appreciate that. Again, it's good to see each one of you here. We welcome you to the service for the Lord. Brother Steve will lead us in our offertory hymn. Thank you, Pastor. 493 for our offertory hymn this morning. 493, Come Ye Thankful People Come. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth. Remain seated.
537 as we continue to sing this morning. 537, Jesus saves. We stand together and sing all four verses. The junior church will be dismissed on the seventh. here this week, this weekend. Come and minister to us, sir. Thank you very much. It's good to meet a few new faces today who've joined us for this Lord's Day, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here so much. Thank you, Pastor. I know it's been hard for him and his wife, and uh, we've certainly been in prayer for them, and I'm really praising the Lord for how you've been taking care of them as well, your concern, and I just wish we, and he does too, wish we had more time. Glad we had some good time together this past year in fellowship and uh, took me out to eat there when I was coming through and wonderful time. I appreciate his heart, his genuineness, his love for the Lord and love for having a church here that honors and glorifies the Lord. And that's encouragement. My wife Jane, of course, is with me. Some of you uh, may not know this and I didn't know that there were a number of people connected to this area until uh, someone mentioned it a moment ago, but she grew up as a teenager uh, over in near Linwood, Boothwin, I forget the exact community where they used to live there in that area. You want to tell me, Jane, where that was? Where is she? I don't see. Was it in Boothwin? Okay. In the Boothwin. I understand a number of you are from over in that direction, Chichester. How many of you live over that way or from that, that area? Okay. A number of you are. And so uh, her dad used to pastor a church that uh, was very strong and standing for the Lord in a big church back in those days of the 60s and early 70s, and that was uh, Marcus Hook Baptist Church at the time. And uh, Dr. Randy Carroll was the pastor, her dad, and God used him there in a marvelous way. And oftentimes when we come back through here, we think about uh, that time period and how many people came to know the Lord. He was on the radio in Philadelphia he had a great radio ministry, and a number of people came to know Christ and surrendered to preach from the radio uh, ministry that he had. He would come to the church and got involved, and were out pastoring, and he'd go back and preach for some of them in their churches after a while. And so just a tremendous uh, opportunity uh, in those days. But you know what? 
It's just preaching the same old-fashioned Word of God. And that's what God did. He saved souls. People learned about Jesus and how to walk with Jesus, how to serve Jesus, um, how to be a blessing to people and reach out for more souls. And, and in those days, especially, the churches grew because they were on the right foundation. And the people went out and lived a life that was pleasing to the Lord, at least attempted to. And um, we saw the Lord work in a mighty way. And uh, I just pray that we'll see that always happen here. I know we're in a few decades past that, but you know what? I don't think that matters. We still preach the Bible, and we still let the Bible have its way in the hearts of people. Because God's still in the soul-saving business. Amen? He still wants to see people come and know the truth and be drawn into the light. And I pray that that will happen through our efforts as well. Philippians this morning in chapter 1. Thank you for being so patient with me in these services thus far, and, and uh, we'll try to end up on time here this morning, but it's certainly been a blessing to share with you what God's been doing in Nova Scotia in both church planning and Christian camp ministry and encouraging these churches as we serve as their interim leadership for a while and trying to help them, as I said before, keep the gospel light on and keep reaching people in their area. And that's been our ministry now over these years. I told someone, I hope we can keep doing this for a long time. You know, when we see the staff begin to come together in late spring there and getting ready for, for summer camp. And every time we have an event there and we see the, the desire on, on the face of the people and wanting to be there and just glean more, and it, it's motivating, you know it? It's exciting to see people who really want to know uh, where other believers are and want to know more about the Lord by being there. And uh, to me, that excites me. It excites me to be with these college students. And I know I might look like their grandpa for sure, but it's nice, to, uh, it's nice to be with them. They have some energy. God says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. There are many reasons for that. They have much energy. They have a way of retaining knowledge and information. And they just need people to step in their path and say, this is how God wants you to use your abilities that He's given you and use your, your knowledge that you have of Him and the Word of God and, and get involved in this, these types of ministries. And that's what we try to do in the summer by giving them that outreach opportunities on the weekend. And God takes them and many of them are so stirred at the fact that God can use them. That a young man I, I uh, recruited one time from a Bible college and he came, he had never preached before, he never sung in public before, uh, he had not done ministry before, but God called him uh, to the ministry, he had gone to this college, was studying, and he came and worked with me that summer, and he had a chance to go to a church, and he ministered there on the weekend, first time he'd ever preached in this fishing village little church, and he came back after being there a couple of weeks, he said, they want me to do communion next week, now what do I do? They didn't have a pastor, so we did a crash communion course in my office, <laughs> and uh, he went back the next week and did communion for the folks. And so that's the exciting part of the ministry that God's given us there. It's not just camp. It's mission field. It's local church. It's, it's mentoring these young men. Uh, we've had a number of people come from various Bible colleges to do internships of different kinds there. Uh, I have a guy coming from Ambassador Baptist College this summer whose parents are actually uh, in ministry there full time. He's worked with me before. He's, going, he's a music um, student there, an ambassador, and he's going to come and lead our music this summer. So we're thrilled about that. And those opportunities are just a blessing to us to have a small part in the lives of those who are serving there. So pray for us that will continue. If you know young people, college students, uh, young adults who have a desire to be a part of a ministry like that, that they can continue to grow in the Lord and be used of the Lord, would you encourage them to come in Nova Scotia? Because we need them, and I believe that God will help them grow as a result of that experience in multiple weeks of being there. Philippians chapter 1, I thought the pastor might preach my sermon in his testimony this morning. I appreciated that testimony because it certainly was an illustration of even what we're going to say here in part this morning. In Philippians you know the passage very well here in the book of Philippians. The context of this is the Apostle Paul and Timothy were greeting the Christians here in Philippi. And as they did so, they were praising God for them. That's in the early verses of this chapter. They were assuring them of, of their prayers for the Philippian believers. 
They were reminding them that the one who started a good work in them, in them would perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And he was expressing his heart for them. There was a longing in Paul's heart that he might come to them. He might be with them. He said, I have you in my heart. Is that words that he used. And he couldn't wait to be with these Philippian Christians. And he says, even though I'm in prison, the gospel is still being advanced. There's still the furtherance of the gospel by you. What a church. What a people. And really, when he gets down to verse 21, 20 and 21, it's like Paul's resolution. Here's what I say about you. Here's the longing of my heart to be with you. But now here is my resolution as a person that's breathing and living and serving God. And my prayer is it'll be mine, and it'll be your resolution as well. In verse 20, he says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Nothing, any association I have with God and His truth, that I will not be ashamed of it. I will not try to back away from it. I will not kind of hide my head like I'm a, I'm a Christian and don't want anybody to know it. I want people to know that I'm unashamed. Paul said that in Romans, didn't he? For I am debtor to these people. I am ready to reach them. I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. And if it has that kind of power to transform a life, Paul says, I don't want to be ashamed of it. I'll be unashamed. But that with all boldness is always, so now also Christ, and catch this phrase, now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, Paul says, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We oftentimes understand that to die is gain as a believer, and we emphasize that. But notice what else he said. To me, to live, that means to breathe, to go to work tomorrow, to go to school tomorrow, to meet a neighbor tomorrow, to rub shoulders with somebody else that's breathing, is Christ. My life's about Christ. It's about people knowing Christ, whom I am unashamed of. So it's not just the gain that comes after we stop breathing. It's Christ in us while we are still breathing. And he says, I want Christ to be magnified. Let's ask God to show us today how Christ can be magnified in my life. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, please today, may thy spirit meet with us. May our hearts, Lord, be moved to the realities that are in our own life right now. Lord, we all fall short of the glory of God. We're thankful for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy of our Lord that made it possible us, for us to hear truth. It truly has, truly has led us out of darkness into His marvelous light, whereby we might now have a different desire in our life than we once did. But Lord, sometimes we have a tendency to drift. We have a tendency to slide backwards we have a tendency not to magnify Christ in our life. And therefore, Lord, I pray today that we would realize, yes, we need to be involved in missions. But Lord, you want us as individuals to be unashamed of our association with Christ. For Lord, if our gospel be hid, you've told us it's hid to those that are lost. Help us, Lord, not to be one that's hiding the gospel but to be an ambassador of this marvelous truth and of the old, old story. Help us to love to tell it so that someone else could know our Savior. Have your way in your work in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's interesting when we put our ear to the pages of the Word of God to hear 
from different individuals who truly magnified the Lord. There are multiple scriptures in the Psalms that tell us this. Of course, Mary said in Luke 1, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. The psalmist said, O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. Raise up His name above all things, persons, ambitions, whatever it is. That's what he's saying. To the point where people see the greatness of God. He also said, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them continually, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. The great missionary, the Apostle Paul, is recorded about his experiences and one particularly in Acts chapter 19. It says, and this, referring to the miracles of Paul, was known to all the Jews and Greeks as dwelling in also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, after he did these miracles, fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now we know what magnify means today, probably better than other generations before us. Because all we do is we take out this little device here that we rarely take it out on a given day, I know. Usually like at night sometime you take this out and look at it. That's kind of what we do, right? Uh, probably when you're not in church, maybe uh, every couple of minutes. You say, that long? <laughs> no. But whatever it is. And we take it and we go like this. We all know what that means, right? I mean, that's just like a universal symbol, okay? All right. We're zooming something out. We're making it bigger, uh, we're magnifying it so we can see it, especially if it's your grandchildren, right, grandparents? Well, you want to go in there and make it about as big as we can, and you've got to hug them on the side or something. We just can't wait to see them again. And children, too, you know. Children, they're great as well, right? And we want to see them, too. But it's, uh, it's just a grandparent thing. But we're magnifying. We understand what that means. And it's so important to get a hold of the fact of the same idea here in Scripture when it uses the word it's a word, uh, just, I'm going to give you a quick Greek lesson. Megaluno, okay? That's the word for it. We know what mega means. Do we have any mega stores out there today? Super stores? I mean, you walk in and it's, wow, it's high, it's wide, it's long, and there's a lot of aisles there. I mean, it's really, really big. They're super stores. They are mega stores. So they are great, and they are large, and they've been made big. And we can see them real well. When he uses this word megaluno here and magnified here in our text in Philippians, that's what he's talking about. Making the Lord large and great before people around us. Now it doesn't mean that we somehow made him greater than he is. No, it's not talking about that. He now has come to the forefront in, the peop in people's lives because you've been there in their presence to make Him look big in their eyes. You have not put yourself back in a corner, kind of in the shadow, and trying to make yourself you know, uh, not seem like you're a Christian in that crowd. Not that you've done, not that you're going crazy among them either, but they know where you stand. They know the testimony that you have. They know that you love Jesus in your school. They know that you love Jesus in your workplace. And you have desired to magnify Him. Today I want you to see very quickly three areas in which we must magnify the Lord. We must magnify Him as the majesty of heaven. We must magnify Him as the master of our life. And we must magnify Him as the message to the world. First of all, if we're going to magnify Him as the majesty of heaven, that requires exaltation. We must let people know that God created this world. We live in a day where people don't believe that. You will talk to them and they will say, no, well, millions of years ago and billions of years ago, this and that happened. It's interesting that whenever you uh, come across articles and it, it really cuts into the evolutionary theory, and they begin to talk about the soft tissue that's in these bones and so forth. And all of a sudden, the evolutionists just start shaking their head because they, you know, it's got to be hard, you know. And so it's interesting how, it, how they are able to come up today. We have a lot of fossils in, in Nova Scotia, by the way. 
I've been in the area there in the Bay of Fundy where you can walk and yes, you can see them down in the rocks because we have some 45, 50 foot tide changes their height. Some of the highest tides in the world are there in that area of the Bay of Fundy off of Nova Scotia. And you walk out there for a long way, you can see the fossils out there in the rocks. So there's a museum up there on the bank and it'll tell you about those millions and billions of years and the fact that God didn't do the creating because they left God out of the whole story. Oh, they'll be there. But I believe when we study the Bible, which is really our final authority, we come to an understanding that it is God who made this world. The Bible says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth, thou hadst formed the earth, and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You know Genesis, Genesis is not the only book where we see God as the creator. It's interesting how many prophets talked about God as the creator. Jeremiah 32, I like the way he opens up, Pastor. He says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. You talk about magnifying the majesty of heaven with those words from the prophet Jeremiah there in verse 32. He said, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light, and the, and the ordinances, that's the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is His name. Magnifying the name of God as the majesty of heaven, the creator of this world. Don't ever get caught up in our secularist thinking about how man, how this world got here. Because the Bible makes it very clear that God is our creator. The psalmist referred to it when he said, I, When I consider the heavens, and I consider the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Why would you ever look at us why would you ever send your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us? Why would you ever give us a place on this earth where we could actually serve and know God? When I consider what you have done with your fingers, with your hands, in creating this world as the majesty of heaven. Why would you, God, ever give us the opportunity to magnify you as the majesty of heaven? It seems like he wouldn't need us to do that, and he doesn't really. But it just gives us the privilege and the opportunity to be able to magnify to people who God is. So we must never turn our head away from those who are boldly saying God didn't create this world. We must speak to them kindly and graciously and loving them, lovingly with the authority of the Bible and tell them that God created this world. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Isaiah said, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The high and holy God is willing to do that. To take your life and mine and, and straighten it out. And we were headed away from God. We were headed into dark places of this world. We were bound for hell forever. And a high and lofty God, the majesty of heaven, was willing to make it possible for us to enter into a relationship with Him. Wow. I can't understand that. Why would He want me to magnify Him? How can I do anything else but magnify Him? after he's brought you and me to where we are this morning, in a relationship with that great king of glory. He gives power to the faint, to them that have no might. He increases strength, Isaiah says. He does that for us. The majesty of heaven does it. How can we ever be ashamed of who he is? Make him the master. Make him the majesty of life. Uh, glorify him and magnify him as the majesty of heaven so that people might understand who he really is. And then secondly, we magnify him as the master of our life. That requires examination. I like what the psalmist said when he said, Thy hands have made me. That has the idea of bringing something into being, like the potter in the clay. 
He goes on to say, and fashion me, that's forming with a certain purpose in mind. And he says, give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. So immediately, as he is purposing the psalmist to magnify the Lord as the master of his life, he recognizes, you have made me. You are forming me now with a purpose in mind. So give me understanding that I might be obedient to your will, that I might follow your commands, your directives, your desire, your will for my life. That ought to be our prayer every day, should it not? Lord, I want you to be the master of my life. And Lord, when you're the master of my life, I see your hands are forming me. We all the time say, well, how can we do this? We've got to stay in the book. We've got to know God. It's just that simple, isn't it? Keep the word of God in our heart that we might not sin against him. Keep ourselves on the altar before God and say, Lord, I'm presenting my life as a living sacrifice to you today. I've done it before, Lord, but I don't want to get off that altar today. I want to bind the ropes around my life. And whenever the ropes begin to loosen because of sin in my life, Lord, I want to come before you and ask your forgiveness and stay on that altar as a living sacrifice. I want to take the admonition, Lord, that you gave in Matthew. You said, take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn of me. Lord, I want to do that. You tell us that it's light. Our burden is light. It's hard to understand that sometimes. But the high, whole idea of a yoke is that the Lord is in one side already. And the other part of that yoke is here. That's a coupling, right? And He wants you, by very nature of bowing down and getting your head, so to speak, in that yoke like the oxen did as they would go forth and plow. He wants us to take that yoke upon us and get in there with the Lord. And magnify Him. Walk with Him. Learn from Him. Live for Him. Magnify Him as the master of our life. God wants us to magnify Him in our entertainment. Magnify Him, as I said, in our school, in our workplace. Magnify Him on our, on our Facebook page, by the way. Any other social media. Magnify Him. Are we ashamed or are we not ashamed? There is no middle ground. The Bible makes it clear that we must deny ourselves, take up His cross, and follow Him. We must follow the wisdom of the book of Proverbs, which says, Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. I tell the young people this at camp and our staff all the time, Proverbs 4 is a tremendous passage to remind all of us, but those in our youth especially, as we're forming these these decisions of life as to who they're going to align themselves with and what's really going to make a difference in their life one way or the other. The Bible says, enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. It doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? There must be a reason why we ought not to be in the path of the wicked. And God knows. That's why I put it in there that if we do that, we will not be making the Lord the majesty of our, the majest master of our life. We'll be making the wicked one the master of our life. That's why we cannot serve two masters, the Bible says. We will hate the one. And we will love the other. We cannot love both of them. And it's important that we grasp a hold of that truth. You know, once we step into devil's territory... The forces of the wicked one will pull upon us. That's why Paul said to the church at Ephesus, neither give place to the devil. I have a chart. I didn't bring it with me this morning. So I usually camp sometimes. It's like an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper with all these white dots on it, white, white squares on it, all over the page. You can picture it, all right? All these little white squares, so it's big, all over it. And then I have colored on those squares just a few places. They're colored black. And I put that verse on the bottom of it, neither give place to the devil. Well, sometimes there are certain squares in our life where we have given the devil entrance. We have given him a spot, a block, a square. We think we can control it so that it won't impact the rest of our page of our Christian life. And somehow it won't really take us away from closeness to God. But the bottom line is, the longer that stays there as prominent and sometimes preeminent in our life, it's going to affect us. Because we can't keep those dark spots there 
and keep him as the master of our life at the same time. We're going to magnify one or the other. He's already the majesty of heaven. He wants us to magnify. He wants to be the master of our life. How can we ever be useful in the hands of the Lord if we're trying to serve two masters? Matthew says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. I look at each one of those statements there, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and start to think about them. If we're going to love Him with all of our heart, that means I'm going to set my affection on God more than any person, place, or thing. If I'm going to love Him with my soul, that means I am going to put my life on that altar and surrender to Him. If I'm going to love Him with my mind, that means I'm going to submit my thoughts to His will, not just my plan. If I love Him with all my strength, that means I'm going to use some of my energy Maybe all my energy to serve God, to the glory of God. Therefore, when we say, I love you, Lord, with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength, do we really mean these things? Is that how it fleshes out in your life when it comes to the practical living? It's one thing to see I love you. It's another thing to actually demonstrate, Lord, that I love you because I'm trying to magnify you. Magnify you as the master of my life, wherever I may be. Can you imagine today there are still people who come in church who don't know Christ? But there was a day that we had a lot of people that would come in churches. Back in the 70s, invite them, they come, they were unbelievers, they would hear the gospel and sometimes walk an aisle and get saved. Remember those days, some of you? That would happen. I'm not saying it's not happening today, it does. But today, Oftentimes, there are people who come and know the Lord because someone who decided to be unashamed of the gospel and to make Christ the master of their life walked into their life space and they saw someone that thought differently, talked differently, acted differently, and were different than what they saw in any given day of their life. They saw those changed people. And as a result, they began to wonder, what makes you like you are? <laughs> why do you do what you do and don't do what you do, what, what others do? And why are you like this? And it's almost like they saw an alien, you know? <laughs> what is this person? And it just opens up conversation for you to explain to them who your God is. The King of kings and Lord of lords. And by your own words and your ways, and you're now going to be magnifying the Lord because He just got bigger in the life of that person who maybe was even an atheist. Maybe not even interested in the things of God except He saw and she saw your life. And it suddenly made them think. That's why I tell the young people, we cannot adopt the modern thinking of some so-called Christians today that I can accept Jesus and go out and live like I want to. I can do all the drinking and I can do all the drugs and I can do all the lifestyle and do anything I want to, go to all the same kind of concerts that sound just like the devil was there instead. I, I, I just, we can't do all those things and somehow come away saying, I just magnified the Lord. You know why? Because those things don't look anything like the Lord. There are many examples of how many of those things have pulled people away from God for all eternity. You want to ask somebody who's in authority or whether it's okay to get involved in the social drinking of our day as some Christians are attempting to do, you go down and talk to people who got involved in that lifestyle and it ruined their family, took family members away from God. You ask a wife, who was beaten by her husband many times, who ended up, maybe end up going to hell and never trusting Christ. You ask that family if social drinking is something that will help them get closer to God. You'll come away with an answer. And maybe shock a lot of people that thinks that's the way to go. Now, I'm not just harping on that today, but I'm finding it being more and more of a trend. There are many things like that that look nothing like a magnified God. 
And we have to get back to the Bible that teaches us who He is. That somehow we are reflecting in our life the character of God so that they can see who He is. They can know who He is. They're in darkness. They don't know unless some believer whose life has been changed and transformed and desire to magnify Him. They'll never know. They may never walk in this church. Our mission is the Great Commission, and that's where we live in our Jerusalem. That's how we live in our Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 5, in that passage of Scripture, we see the Great Commission that Jesus had already given. We magnify Him finally as a message to the world. Peter had preached through two sermons by the time he got to Acts 5. These followers of Christ were persecuted. Peter had already said that verse in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He would already preached that. So now the apostles are in prison in Acts chapter 5. And the Bible tells us in this passage that the angel of the Lord came and, came and swung the door open and told him to go, stand, and speak all the words of this life. <laughs> I like that emphasis there. Go, stand, and speak all the words of this life. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. If we magnify him as the message to the world, they're going to see someone whose life has changed. You have a compassion. If you were to journey with Jesus through the New Testament, in the various places that he went, and just pick up on the times that he showed compassion to someone. It's a great Bible study. You see his heart in each of the chapters, or the, you read it in the Gospel of John. If you just took John and did that, you begin to see his concern and his heart. And, you know, Zacchaeus, you come down from going to your house today. He would heal the blind man. And Bethesda in John chapter 5, he's there. And he saw the impotent man who, as the waters were, rough, were, were moving e each year, and, and, the, and the people were getting in to be healed by faith. And, and this man could not get in. And Jesus lovingly came over and understood his faith. And he was able to, to walk. He was able to move about. He'd been healed. Jesus, compassion. And it goes on and on and on through Scripture. I like the compassion that Jesus had. He saw the multitudes. The Bible says he had much compassion on the multitudes. Jesus had compassion on individuals. He had compassion for, for communities and towns. He and, the, he and the apostles had been in Capernaum casting out demons and healing the sick for some time. And Simon comes and approaches Jesus the next day. And he said, Jesus, all men seek for thee. And Jesus' response was, I must go to the next towns that I may preach there also. There was one more place that needed to know truth. I think it's a great application of Jesus was here and now there's another place. I must go there also. I've been doing the work of God here. I've got to go to another place. There's some more people that need to hear. People who don't like evangelism, they haven't been watching Jesus. They haven't been understanding His compassion and His love and His journey on this earth when He was here. And oh, how we need to be doing the same thing. The psalmist said, declare His glory among the heathen, His wonders among all people. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Most of you know the name William Carey. His life was influenced by the faithfulness of David Brainerd. William Carey lived from 1761 to 1834. The more and more he read and read and read, he learned about the people groups of this world. This is before there were missions conferences, there were no mission teams, and there was, there was nothing like that going on. But he began to read about, about the people groups around the world and his heart began to be stirred. And there in his cobbler's uh, shop as he began to make this, this globe, uh, this, this globe of the world. And some wasn't some enthusiastic conference of any kind. But he felt the call of God there. And he said these words that have been recorded and we know them well. If it be the duty of all men to believe the gospel. Let me ask you this morning. Is it the duty of all men to believe the gospel? Sure is if they're going to go to heaven. 
So he said, if it be the duty of all men to believe the gospel, then it be the duty of those who are entrusted with the gospel to endeavor to make it known among all nations. William Carey sobbed out, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. If it's the duty of man to know the gospel and to believe it before they can go to heaven, and you've entrusted it with all those who already know the gospel and already bound for heaven, then Lord, send me to magnify him as the message to the world. That was his vision. 1792, 3, in that time period, he and John Thomas set out from England to go to India and begin what we know is our modern missionary movement. And many have gone since those days to reach people around the world. But do you realize, beloved, as our population continuously increases and the missions force decreases, we're still in a situation where billions have not heard the clear presentation of God's Word. You say, with all the technology, yes. So many have not heard. It was one more soul when Philip went to the desert to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. It was one more soul when Simon found his brother Andrew to tell him about Jesus. It was one more soul when Paul stood before Agrippa and gave his testimony and said, and Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. It was one more soul that John Bunyan was looking for when he said, if you let me out of prison today, you're the writer of Pilgrim's Progress, if you let me out of prison today, I'll preach today, and I'll preach the gospel again tomorrow by the grace of God. <laughs> one more soul. Edward Kimball witnessed to a 19-year-old teenager and who worked in a Boston shoe store. Edward Kimball was so nervous when he went by the... By the um, shoe store he, got, he was so nervous that he went actually by the door and he walked back and walking back he was so nervous but he felt such a burden to witness to this 19 year old teenager in this shoe store who was working there and he went in as a result of his efforts edward kimball led d.l moody to the lord jesus christ one person don't even know his name most people but he had a desire to magnify christ as the message to the person that God had put in his life space who needed to hear about Jesus. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Are you desiring, is your resolution of life to magnify Christ? Whether it be by life or whether it be by death. A man named John Getty and I close with this. He was born in 1815 in Scotland. He later moved to Nova Scotia. Interesting enough. He was a man that was married in 1838. He and his wife sailed from Halifax in 1846, November 30, 1846, and landed in Samoa October 17, 1847. You say, why didn't he take a 737? They went around. <laughs> the ships, it took a long time. I mean, you took your life into your own hands when you stepped off the deck to head towards the mission field. And this man named John Getty had a desire for those people in the South Seas. And he went to that place where there were cannibals, where the people believed that when the husband died that the wife needed to be killed so that her spirit could go on with his spirit. But he had such a heart. He ministered there for several years and not even seeing one person coming to the Lord. They didn't even have the Bible in their own language. He tried to learn the language of the people and it took a long time. And finally the day came when his first, the first person understood who Jesus was. Accepted him. He began to train them going to reach out to some of those islands that were around that region and to see some guys go there and be a leader in planting a church in those places. God used John Getty in a marvelous way despite people trying to kill him. His own little boy died there on the field that God had given them. He translated the Bible. He established schools. And after 24 years in 1872, 
December 14, John Getty died. So they put a plaque on the pulpit, because not only had he preached in Nova Scotia, he had preached in, in Prince Edward Island, hometown of some here, home, uh, province of some here. They put this plaque on the pulpit that said the following. In memory of John Getty, D.D., born in Scotland, 1815, minister in PEI, seven years, missionary sent from Nova Scotia to Anicham for 24 years. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. And when he left, there were no heathen. Doesn't mean everyone knew the Lord, but they were in darkness. Nobody to stand in their path to magnify God before them. John Getty went and did it. He suffered for sacrifice, was loss. To think of many, many souls in his presence today, rejoicing in heaven. Because eternity is what he had in view. This life is really short. Eternity. Are we doing that kind of ministry? Magnifying Christ where God has planted us. God help us to do it. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. I will ask, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if there's someone here this morning who would say, Preacher, I do not know for sure if I were to die today that, that I would go to heaven. I live in an area where you can hear the gospel. and I've come to this church a number of times. And you've grown up in this church. Maybe you're a child still trying to figure it all out or a teenager. You say, Preacher, I don't know for sure, but I would like to know that I'm going to heaven someday. I'm, more, I'm interested in knowing more about it. And I just want to raise my hand for prayer because I know I need to trust Christ. I want to go to heaven someday. I've not done this before, and I know that I need to do it. Nobody's going to come to you. Nobody's going to call your name. But just lift that hand up. And by lifting that hand, as that heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'll pray for your lifted hand. Anybody this morning, pray for me, preacher. I don't know for sure that I'm going to heaven. I sure would like to know that. Dear Christian, has God brought somebody to your mind? that you need to influence, you need to be with, that you need to magnify the Lord in front of. And what that means is that we have to get closer to God for the power, the boldness, for the strength to take those things out of our life that do not please Him. So when they see how God's changed us, they see someone totally different and who they are and what they love as an unbeliever. You say, Preacher, God's spoken to my heart this morning. There are some things that I know need to be changed in my Christian life so that I can truly magnify Him as a holy God to an unholy world. God's spoken to me as a Christian. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Pray for me. I am a Christian. God's spoken to me about some things in my life this morning. Lift that hand up, Christian, right now. I'll pray for you. Anybody at all this morning? Pray for me, preacher. Father, we're thankful that you have, by thy spirit, communicated truth to us today. We realize that we need thee every hour. We realize that each day as we wake we must come afresh and anew and say, I surrender all today. I not only give you, Lord, my life, I want to give you every room of my life. I want to give you every closet in my rooms. I want to give you every shoebox that's on the shelf in those closets. I want you to have it all. May that be our heart's desire today. As we go forth, truly understanding what it means for to me to live is Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to ask our heads to be bowed just for a moment as we stand to our feet. The pianist will play 390, which we'll sing in a moment. I wanted to play through a stanza first with our heads bowed. And I want you to talk to God in your own heart this morning. You feel free to come if you'd like and kneel here at the front. The altar where I preach anyway is always open for people to come and kneel and talk to God. And I'd encourage you to do that. For those who prefer to stand, stand there before the Lord and talk to Him now as we listen to this song. 
All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Him, I freely give. I'll ever love and trust Him. In His presence daily live. I surrender all. Let's sing that first stanza and also the last stanza and think about the words as we sing them as we close. 390 in your hymn book, 390 as we sing together as well. truly say, I surrender all, Lord. Now I'm going out the doors to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritual fruit, blessing from God is a result of all that. Pastor, you close this as you see fit.